I'm teaching on a subject that I title Lifted by Grace. Please, I want you to pay attention. Lifted by Grace. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 12, please. We'll read from verse 8 and 9. Second Corinthians 12, 8 and 9. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me, the thorn in Paul's flesh. And his response, God's response was very interesting. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. I want us to stop there. My grace is sufficient for you. A man comes to God and cries concerning his inabilities, concerning his vulnerabilities, concerning his inadequacies. And God's answer to such a man is, my grace is sufficient for you. Help us in the name of Jesus Christ. In 2 Peter chapter 1 from verse 2, Let's read down to 4, 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 to 4. The Bible says, Grace and peace is multiplied to you in the knowledge. Be multiplied to you in the knowledge of our God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're reading to verse 4. It says, As his divine power hath given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who has called us by glory and virtue. It says, Okay, well, you're reading New King James. If we can have King James, that's fine. It says, whereby we've been given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. It says, that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through loss. At the back of every extraordinary life in the kingdom, at the back of every extraordinary um, achievement for want of word is the grace of God. Like Pastor rightly said, in this kingdom we are made by grace. We are lifted by grace. And it is important that we understand the grace of God alongside the dynamics of the supply of that grace. Hallelujah. For everyone you have celebrated for everyone you have admired for everyone in the kingdom whose life has inspired you to any degree i am telling you categorically that behind such phenomenal strides is the grace of god and it's important for us to come to terms with that because trying to achieve results that only come by grace without grace will frustrate you Results in this kingdom are purely a function of grace. Hallelujah. This is very, very important. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 5, I love what the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 5. Please give it to us. The Bible says, not that we are sufficient. Is that in your Bible? Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves. It says, but our sufficiency is of God. Verse 6. It says, who hath made us able. The word able there means qualified. The word able there is the same word sufficient. That means the capacity to rise to the occasion. Our supposed qualification our sense of merit is derived from this grace that has made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. The Bible says, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit gives life. What then is grace? As, as popular as this word sounds across the body of Christ, you will be amazed to understand that very, very few people, respectfully speaking, have the slightest idea about the concept of grace nor the administration, God's system for administering grace. So 
we talk about grace all the time across the body of Christ, but very few people really understand the concept nor the system of its administration. This is the reason why, in spite of the fact that we talk a lot about grace, the results do not show that there is a supply of grace in our lives. Are we together? What then is grace? Years ago when I took time to study this subject, I was surprised how difficult it was to define grace. It sounds very easy, but when you dig deep with thoughtfulness, if you really understand what you are saying, you should be at a loss as to being able to capture in English the kind of definition that would best express the concept of grace. And so in the place of prayer, I found a definition that I felt would bless me and that people would be able to relate to. And I found that in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Let's read together if you can see it projected. Ready? One to read. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh -huh, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Say blessed. Say spiritual blessings. One more time. Say blessed. Say all spiritual blessings. These for me is the most concise capture of the word grace. Because any other attempt to define grace will only mean that you will have to compartmentalize grace. And while it is true that grace is manifold and multidimensional, the Bible here says God hath blessed us. And he says he blessed us with all spiritual blessings. So my definition of grace is all spiritual blessings. All spiritual blessings that have been given to the believer to produce a life of victory. But it is accessed only through the office and the person of the Christ. All spiritual blessings made available to the believer for a victorious life. But then it is accessed only through the office of the Christ. This is my definition of grace. So grace is not just limited to sufficiency. It is not just limited to favor. It is not just limited to access. It is all encompassing. That means every spiritual blessing. Please look up. Every advantage that has been provided for, for the believer, that can become an instrument of victory in your life, is called grace. Every. That means power is grace. Wisdom is grace. Faith is grace. Provided it sustains the ability to translate to your victory. And it is only routed through the office of the Christ. It is called grace. If you do not have to consult the office of the Christ to access it, it is not grace. For it to be called grace, the office of the Christ must become the principal center point of administration. That means if you route that ability through another medium other than the Christ, it may be ability, but it is not called grace. It matters that it passes through the office of the Christ to be called grace. Are we together now? So if I see you displaying a semblance of wisdom, before we call that wisdom grace, we will have to vet whether that wisdom passed through the office of the Christ. And there is one litmus test. If it passes through the office of the Christ, then you are saddled with the responsibility of using it for your profiting, but to reveal Christ. So if we do not find the revelation of Christ captured in your display of spiritual abilities, we have a right to vet the source. It is not grace. Are we together now? It's important for us to have this frame of thinking. Again, let me repeat. 
that when it is the grace of God, it generically refers to every spiritual blessing made available to the believer but routed through the person and the office of the Christ. Hallelujah. So if you go to a herbalist and you access power, that is not called grace because the Christ factor is ignored in that process. Are we together? In fact, if your sufficiency comes from yourself, it does not matter the result it produces. It is not called grace. The moment Christ has to be isolated from that process, it no longer is called grace. Are we together? It is not the workability of the ability that makes it grace. It is the, the Christocentric character. The fact that Christ is not alienated from that process. That is what makes it grace. Are we together now? This is very, very important because there are many believers who deal with the subject of grace in isolation to the person and the office of the Christ. So we see grace like an anointing that is independent of Christ. I can access it. It doesn't matter whether I have a relationship with God or not. If the anointing is in a bottle of oil whether Christ is represented or not once I can pour it on my head and it commands some possibilities in my life they say I am walking in grace no no if Christ is not captured in that process and if it does not lead to the ultimate revelation of the Christ it is not grace are we together 